Welcome everyone to today's webinar in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. My name is Matt Balhoff and I'm the director of the center. To learn more about us, please visit our website. The link is provided below. Follow us on LinkedIn and uh, join our YouTube channel. A little bit more about the center is that we are a group of researchers at the University of Texas at Austin that are focused on all aspects of subsurface energy and the environment. Some of the research we do is shown here, a variety of subsurface applications, technical disciplines and engineering tools. We collaborate with industry in many different ways. One of those is with our industrial affiliate programs, uh, some of which are listed here. If you're interested in any of these, then please contact us. Our monthly webinars are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. They are hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. Uh, we hope that you're able to attend live, but if you're not able to, then all of our webinars are posted on YouTube a few days after the live event. Uh, please feel free to share that uh, with others. We do have some upcoming webinars. So next month is uh, going to be Omar Ali and Hang Ren. Uh, from the chemistry department. They're going to talk about integration of CO2 capture and conversion for carbon utilization and storage. In November, Dr. Gary Pope will, will give a, uh, a webinar. Uh, we do ask that um, you post your questions in the Q&A section, and you can do that at any point during the webinar. Um, so you, as soon as the question comes up, you can post that, and uh, our speaker will uh, address that question um, if time uh, it remains uh, at the end. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce to today's speaker, which is Dr. Charlie Worth uh, from the Civil and in Environmental Engineering Department at UT Austin. So Dr. Worth is a professor and Betty Margaret Smith Chair of Environmental Health Engineering in the Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering here at UT Austin. He joined our faculty in 2014. His research and teaching focus is on the fate and transport of pollutants in the environment, the development of innovative catalytic technologies for drinking water treatment, and the mitigation of environmental impacts associated with energy production and gener generation. Dr. Worth received uh, his BS in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M University and an MS and PhD in environmental engineering from Stanford. So with that, I would like to uh, pass it on to Charlie, who's going to talk to us about carbonate mineral reactions during geological carbon sequestration and implications for induced seismicity. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. It's a real pleasure to be able to give this webinar. Um, um, as Matt said, my name's Charlie Worth, um, and I'm here at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, in uh, civil architectural environmental engineering. And today I'm going to talk about these carbonate mineral reactions that are occurring during geological carbon sequestration and implications for induced seismicity. I've worked with a number of researchers over the years on this and very closely related topics. The main results I showed, I'll show today were collected by two students, Samantha Fuchs and uh, David Kyungte Kim. Uh, Samantha was a graduate student, is now out uh, working with Geosyntec, and David is a current graduate student. Uh, quite a few folks here at UT Austin uh, in petroleum engineering. There's uh, Nicholas Espinoza uh, and Kishore Mohante uh, in chemistry, Graham Henkelman and Manta Jagannath, and here in uh, civil engineering, Lynn Katz. Uh, Anga Teresa Akano from Northwestern. Uh, several collaborators from the University of Illinois and also from NETL. Um, the work that I'm going to present was funded by uh, the DOE from different sources. Originally, I was involved in a center for geologic storage of CO2. It was an EFRC center, and that was led uh, by uh, Scott Fraley at Illinois. Uh, we also had funding uh, toward the tail end of that from NETL, um, and then um, more recently funding through the DOE BES Geosciences Program. So I want to acknowledge those. So um, back in the, oh, let's say around 2010 or maybe a little bit before, 
the DOE funded seven regional uh, geological carbon sequestration partnerships to assess, to assess site costs and safety for CO2 storage. Um, the seven sites are listed here, and they were important um, for many reasons. They were, they were basically big field laboratories. And at each of these sites, um, they chose them because they had, in some cases, uh, different um, geology. For example, some were saline aquifers uh, or basalt formations or coal seams. And then large amounts of CO2 were injected and monitored uh, for storage safety and also in some cases for seismicity concerns. In total, about 11.1 million metric tons of CO2 were injected across these seven sites. The one that I was associated with or built on and what motivated our EFRC when I originally started working in this area was the Midwest Geological Sequestration Consortium and it was led by the Illinois State Geological Survey, Scott Fraley. And there, uh, they evaluated CO2 injection at this Illinois Basin indicator site. And if you look, you see the Illinois Basin there and you see Decatur is the topmost star right in the middle of the state. Um, this effort was started in 2011 and ended in 2014. And approximately, a, uh, I'm sorry, a thousand metric tons per day of CO2 is injected with the goal of injecting about 1 million metric tons. So here's an overview of the Illinois uh, Basin Decatur project. And so it took place at this ADM, it's Archer Daniels Midland facility in Decatur, Illinois, where they were converting ethanol into, I'm sorry, corn into ethanol. And if you've ever brewed beer, you know that when you ferment a sugar, uh, you get both ethanol and you get CO2 and the CO2 outgasses. And so you get a very pure source of CO2 from this relative to say, a a coal-fired combustion plant. So you take that CO2, uh, you dehydrate it, and you compress it, and this occurred at this point location A, and then it was piped about two kilometers over to the injection location C, where it was injected uh, deep into the ground into the Mount Simon formation, and I'll show you that shortly. Um, located a little bit farther away, maybe let's say around 400 meters um, away, is point D, which was a verification and monitoring well site. And then there were acoustic uh, receptors located all over the site, and I'll get into that in just a bit. So first, as I mentioned, the CO2 was injected into the Mount Simon formation. If you look at the Mount Simon formation in Illinois, this gives you an idea of the thickness. It's thickest up uh, here at the top, where we might get as great as 2,000 feet of thickness of that Mount Simon formation. And as you go south into Illinois, it depletes and the lower value here is about 500 feet thick. When you look at the stratigraphy going down to the Mount Simon sandstone, you can understand why they chose this. Uh, one, it has a high permeability, but two, uh, it was thought that this Eau Claire shale would form the seal for the reservoir. So when you inject the CO2, it's buoyant, it comes up, and it's thought that this would provide a barrier to upward migration. Also, if you go even farther up, you've got this, I don't know quite how to say this, Maquetta shale, and then the New Albany shale. And so you have two backup seals higher up, and then uh, up here, these Pennsylvania coal seams. So there's a lot of stratigraphy between where this Mount Simon sandstone occurred and the ground surface. Also, even though only one metric or a million metric tons were being injected, it was estimated that this Mount Simon sandstone had 11 to about 150 billion metric tons of storage capacity. And so it had a high potential for future use. This shows the relative permeability in the Mount Simon sandstone. You can see how it uh, varies somewhat with depth. The important thing though is right at the cutoff here, around 6,400 feet, you see that the porosity gets very, very small and that's where you hit the Eau Claire shale. You also see if you go down below the Mount Simon sandstone to this pre-Mount Simon, the porosity also drops off sharply and that's a fractured bedrock. And then below that, you have more solid granite. Another interesting feature here is that if you look at the zone of injection, it just happens where this little box is in the diagram and that's over a 55 foot section. And so at this point of injection, this entire thickness is about, oh, let's say 600 feet. 
and only 55 feet of that at the very base of it are used being used for injection. So just a small amount. So that provides a lot of room for this lateral upward migration. And then we have the Eau Claire up here, which could potentially act as a seal uh, for this upward migration. Conceptually, when we think about CO2 injection, we think that we inject this supercritical CO2. It's more buoyant than the surrounding brine fluid, and so it'll rise up. As it rises up, you get some of the CO2 trapped by capillary forces, so little kind of um, supercritical gas-like bubbles trapped in the porous media. You have solubility trapping where the CO2 then dissolves into carbonic acid, and so it dissolves into the water and creates a more acidic environment. And then you have some of that CO2 through buffering being converted to carbonate and then reacting with calcium to form minerals, these calcium carbonate solids. So in our case, we were concerned with how this carbonic acid, this reaction where we get solubility trapping, how that affects the reaction with these minerals and if that affects any of these geomechanical properties uh, of the Mount Simon formation. This just shows the wellhead after it was drilled and uh, capped and uh, pumping CO2 in. So one very important set of measurements that were done was uh, pressure, and this was done um, at this monitoring verification well. So the point of injections here, we're doing monitoring downfield. And recall, um, there's a little screen here that shows the depth where the CO2 is injected. If you look at this monitoring well where the CO2 is injected, you see or at the same depth, you see that you get a big rise in the pressure and then you see fluctuations. And this happens when the CO2 is turned off and then turned back on. You get these pressure fluctuations. If you go a little bit up, you see there's a little bit increase in pressure and then maybe a few fluctuations that correspond with the deeper depths, but not a lot. And then if you go even shallower, let's say up near 6,600 feet, you can see that there's almost no increase in pressure and you don't have these fluctuations. Um, recall that the thickness of the Mount Simon, it goes up to about 6,400 feet here. And so really these effects of the CO2 being injected are not being felt at the shallower elevations within the Mount Simon Reservoir. And that's a big deal. And what it suggests is that that CO2, even though it's buoyant, is not rising up um, throughout the Mount Simon formation and reaching that Eau Claire formation. And so that provides more storage security. To try to interpret um, and to, I guess, lend support for that argument, uh, the group at Wright State uh, did outcropping mapping. And so the Mount Simon formation, the outcrops are located in Missouri. And so they went over there, uh, they found exposed outcrops, uh, they made nice cuts uh, so you get clean looks at them. And then they took pictures of this and then digitized it or took digital pictures and then converted that uh, through different measurements of permeability in each of the different strata into this, um, I think, numerical representation of the geologic and permeability heterogeneity. They then took what they obtained from the outcrop and they using geostatistical methods so that they conserve length scales and permeability distributions, things like that. They then converted this into a numerical aquifer of the Mount Simon formation. And so the goal then was then after creating this was to look at what happens to the CO2 when it's injected into the Mount Simon formation. Now through this process, they found you have this layering in the outcrop. And so by extension then in the Mount Simon formation where the CO2 is being injected, you have this layering. There was support from this through geophysical methods. So if we look in the Mount Simon, geophysical methods show that we had layering as well in this system. And so when the Wright State folks did their simulations then, um, they simulated the injection of CO2. They went over 24 months and they did it in a, um, uh, in a system that was scaled uh, to match the conditions of the Mount Simon. And here's the bottom of the Mount Simon, this line here, and it's called, or just above this pre-Mount Simon. Uh, 
And then here's the middle Mount Simon. So you'd go up even farther to capture the whole Mount Simon formation. But what you see is that the CO2, instead of following our conceptual model where it migrates upward towards the Eau Claire, it spreads out laterally. And so these finer laminations where you have this layering of the sands, the sandstone, you get fine and coarser sands, provides enough capillary resistance so you get this stratigraphic, stratigraphic trapping of the CO2 and it's not rising up as we would have expected it to. And this is really great because what it means is that even within the Mount Simon formation, we have the capacity to resist or mitigate this upward migra migration of the CO2. Uh, so that's another barrier, this stratigraphic trapping to upward migration. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, along with these geophysical methods to look at the stratigraphy, there was also geophysical methods that were looking at seismic events. Um, they looked at both seismic events and also tried to look at this injected CO2 plume. One of the big, I don't know, surprises or maybe disappointments in the effort when this was done was that really with this time-lapse vertical seismic profiling, they couldn't detect the plume until about greater than 730 tons were injected. So really you couldn't see where it was going. There just wasn't enough sensitivity. But what they were able to determine uh, with this uh, acoustic monitoring was seismic events. And so shown here is a map of all the different seismic events that were detected. And this, these were uh, detected both during and then after injection. And so the left is the scale. And so you go from kind of the reddish to the bluish hues it would be the, the largest uh, seismic events. And these are all micro seismic events. They're not felt events uh, at the ground surface. And then the number indicates the time uh, sequence that they occurred in. And so our CCS1 is where the injection occurred. And we get our first seismic event uh, just to the what the northwest of that a bit, kind of more west. And then a little closer to that injection well, point two. And then uh, three is also clustered in there. Four, you get up a little more north. Five, you go a little east. They're still in this main cluster. But then six jumps down here, all right? Um, when you go to seven, um, you go back into the cluster. I kind of lost track. Oh, there it is up here. I'm sorry, just off to the bottom right. Eight down here, nine, 10, 11, and then 12 jumps over here. Uh, 13 comes back. You get 14 jumps out. 15, 16, 17, and then 18's out here. And the main thing you get from this is that things are certainly not homogeneous. Uh, they're not occurring in a sequence where it would go radially outward from the point of injection. They're also not occurring radially outward uh, or in a radial pattern. They're occurring on different flow paths or kind of pressure conduits, or perhaps where we have faults located where we're getting slip. So all these are possibilities and it's not known, but one thing this plot does tell us is that we certainly have the potential for micro seismicity. Uh, it's difficult to predict and it's occurring at locations that could be influenced by conduits of higher porosity, let's say, or higher permeability, or possibly where we have existing faults and or those faults are more likely to slip. So, that makes a complication and also brings up concern that we can have possibly larger felt seismic events uh, that would then indicate a risk uh, for this injection. All right, so when we think about the possible reasons for this uh, micro seismicity, we think about increased pressure from injection that promotes displacement along existing fresh fr uh, fractures. Increased pressure from injection creates new fractures. And the one that we focused on, because I'm more uh, a geochemist, would be acidic brine created from CO2 promotes mineral dissolution and failure along existing fractures under strain. And so that's what we chose to focus on and to explore that possible reason or that hypothesis. So the objective of this first effort I'm going to talk about was to determine if geochemical reactions, and by that we are looking at mineral dissolution, uh, during this CO2 injection 
that these reactions are weakening the reservoir rock and contributing to these micro seismic events. So we originally started working with the Mount Simon sandstone. Uh, that's where we were closely, or that's where all the field work was done. And we would fracture it and then try to hold strain. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Or, um, but the results were very inconsistent. We couldn't uh, fracture it in a uniform way. And the Mount Simon, uh, when we uh, would uh, um, induce strain, uh, we couldn't uh, get it to hold. Uh, in those systems in a consistent way. So what we chose then is to use a Bandera gray sandstone. Um, like the Mount Simon sandstone, it's mainly cemented by uh, illites, illite clays. Um, the Bandera gray stone also has illite cements, uh, but it also has carbonate cements. And so if we look here at the Bandera gray, it's primarily quartz. It has about 16% dolomite, 10% uh, illite, and 12% uh, plagioclase and then minor amounts of uh, kaolinite clays and chloride. You can also see there's some banding within it. And when you get down at the uh, kind of the microscopic scale or the millimeter scale, let's say, you start to see uh, it's quite heterogeneous with lots of distributions of minerals and, um, and things like that. So one of the first things we did was before we uh, did experiments with it, is we wanted to just look at it up close to see if the sample we had was consistent with what was provided by the supplier of the Bandera Gray. And so we used both uh, bright field microscopy as uh, well as scanning electron microscopy. And what you see is these uh, kind of, I don't know, pinkish type grains uh, that are relatively smooth are quartz. When we have mottled kind of grains, that's the feldspar. The dolomite's really hard to see with the, the bright field. It shows up blue, uh, kind of almost like a pore space uh, in these images, but in the SEM, it shows up a lot more clearly. And then we get the, kind of this uh, more kind of, um, I don't know, kind of thin crystal or needle-like uh, 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 appearance, and you can't see it in this image, but of chlorite. When we look at this under SEM, because the dolomite has a, a relatively high iron content, we can see that it really shows up well and we can see how it tends to fill pore spaces. And so it's one of the cementing uh, minerals within this matrix. Um, a lot of these dark little spots are clays. And so they also provide cements between, uh, uh, between grains as well, uh, but not as much as the dolomite. So that would be a difference between the Mount Simon and the Bandera Gray. So originally we tried to create natural fractures. This is a natural fracture here in the upper right. We have a core. It's about a, a maybe an, a, an inch and a half uh, in diameter, maybe an inch to an inch and a half long. We would fracture that and then we would uh, displace it against each other. And I'll show you how we do that in a second. And we try to uh, then look at that, um, sh um, the shear release over time, but we could not get consistent results. So we did something that an engineer would do, and uh, if you're a geoscientist, maybe you'll cringe a little bit at this approach, but uh, we thought it worked pretty well, is that we took these two core halves and then we milled a pattern into them where we have these raised disparities. And these raised disparities are each about 0.1 millimeter tall, and we have these on either side of the core halves. Then we lock those in place and do our displacement under uh, compressive um, pressure and then induce that strain in that way. And now it holds and then is released over time. And so the idea is that the points where these asperities interlock with each other, that's similar to where we have contacts in a natural fracture and where they're uh, holding that strain and looking at how that is released over time. But now we're doing it in a, a reproducible way and one that we can have replicate experiments for. Um, if you look at this um, CT image here, each little square here represents one of these raised disparities. One comes from the bottom part of the core and the other comes from the top part of the core. And so they alternate in this pattern. And then in between, we had these flow channels that were about 0.1 millimeters uh, deep. And so you got more brine flow through these flow channels and then it could 
uh, diffusion or if there is advection uh, through the actual sandstone itself where these asperities were uh, flow somewhat through there. So we took these two sample halves, let's say side A and side B of the core. We have the interlocked asperities. We put it in this custom trioxial core holder. This was done at NETL. We put it under uh, 2000 PSI confining pressure. We crank a screw, it presses one side of this and displaces it relative to the other side. So here's our two halves. Uh, we have the two plugs on either side. When we turn the screw, it moves one side relative to the other, creating this strain, which can then be released over time. All right. Um, this sample holder then, or this triaxial flow cell, um, we purge it after we apply this uh, strain. Uh, we purge it or push through it a brine. It's a 0.5 molar uh, potassium iodide brine. The iodide is used as a contrast agent for the CT uh, imaging. And we used either um, pH 4 brine, and this was done with uh, nitric acid. Um, we didn't have uh, elevated temperature capabilities in this triaxial whole cell holder, so we did not use CO2 to create this pH, uh, but nitric acid. And then we also had a reservoir simulated brine where we crushed up rock, this uh, Bandera gray sandstone, equilibrated it with the water over uh, a couple of weeks, and then just uh, uh, decanted off the water, and it was at 8.3 and used that to flush it through. During the experiment, we loaded this into an industrial CT uh, system, and then we imaged that over time uh, to look at the movement or the relative movement of these two halves. So here was the main result and one that we had uh, postulated uh, that would happen. And that was that if you look at this volume average compressive strain, it decreases more quickly over time for the case with the lower pH than the higher pH, all right? And so basically it's showing that because of the lower pH, it is weakening the reservoir rock or this Bandera gray sandstone. And then these contact points at the asperity are yielding and allowing that strain to be released over time. And so the next task was then interpreting or I think more kind of supporting our uh, expectations of why this is occurring or did occur. So the first thing we did was uh, laser profilometry looking at these asperities. So this is the initial mill asperity. And then at the end of the experiment, after this seven days of basically flow and this strain release, we looked at the asperities that were uh, in contact with the pH 4 brine, flowing brine through it, and that in contact with the pH 8.3, and or this reservoir simulated brine. And what we found is that just visually, that these asperities that were in contact with each other at lower pH were more degraded than at higher pH. We could quantify the roughness from these laser profilometry images. And we see that the roughness at the end of the experiment that was subject to the lower pH conditions was greater than at the higher pH compared to the initial conditions before the experiment began. So we're getting more degradation of those asperities where the contact is held uh, between those two core halves. The next thing was to look at the images. I already showed you these initial images on the far left. But then after the experiment was done, we took uh, basically the very top or the surface of those um, of the cords that were in contact and we created thin sections out of those. And we did it for the experiments that were done at pH 4 and then for the reservoir simulated brine. And just observationally, it looked like we got more open pore space in these uh, images that were at the lower pH and less dolomite. Uh, compared to the reservoir simulated case and certainly compared to the initial case. So we took many of these images and quantified that. And there's two things we quantified. One was the porosity and the other was the amount of dolomite present. And what we found was in support of our just general observations, when we looked at many images and quantified this, we got a higher porosity from the experiment that was exposed to pH 4, the lower pH. And we also got lower dolomite. So this is showing that, yes, this lower pH solution was dissolving the dolomite. Uh, yes, it was creating a higher porosity, and that's related to this faster strain release at the lower pH. 
The last thing we did, and this was over in uh, Nicholas Espinoza's lab here in petroleum engineering at UT, was to perform scratch tests where we could measure the fracture toughness. And so basically you have your sample, this yellow would be our sample of Bandera gray. And we did this on the original sample and then on that milled surface, both on the asperities and off the asperities um, after the experiments were performed. We take a, uh, basically a stylus, it's got a kind of a conical point down here at the end and it has a load on it. And so depending on uh, our sample, that point depresses so far into the sample, just the overlying force from it. And then what we do is we move the sample laterally so the stylus is dragged across the surface and we measure that lateral force. And that lateral force is this F sub T, right? Um, P is just the a perimeter length around that stylus and A is the projected area of the stylus at that uh, point where it's, um, uh, where it's in debt, where it sinks down into the sample. And so we can calculate our fracture toughness and you could think about it as basically how much force does it take to dislodge grains from the surface of this material. And what you find is that the fracture toughness after the experiments at lower pH is less than at the reservoir simulated pH and less than the original sample. So this shows that we are indeed compromising this uh, geomechanical integrity of the rock um, and that we're increasing the porosity and decreasing the amount of dolomite with the acidic brine and that's allowing this fracture or this uh, strain release to occur. So these results prompted two additional questions. One is what is the mechanisms of this carbonate mineral dissolution and then can we amend the ejection fluid to mitigate this carbonate mineral dissolution? So two questions. And to do that, we dove more into a, a more fundamental study. And we used a very pure system. And we looked at just calcite. And we use calcite because it's well characterized, because many others have looked at uh, dissolution. And there's a good amount of theory out there so we could extend that uh, with these questions that we are interested in answering. So for this, we had a high pressure and temperature reactor. It's a little different conditions. Um, it was at 1300 PSI, 50 degrees C, so it's super critical conditions. We have a 0.4 molar uh, potassium chloride brine. Um, in this case, we're looking at dissolution of a calcite slab on the right. We're interested in the etch pits that are forming on the surface. We have our brine here, which you can see. Uh, in this case, it's saturated with supercritical CO2, and overlying that uh, is a supercritical CO2 uh, that's in the pure phase, so no liquid or no brine at the top. So we allow this to age uh, for a certain time period, and then we can look at, uh, we can sample the fluid during the experiment. And so we have a, um, a port here with the pressure release valve to capture that fluid at its function of time. And then at the end of the experiment, we can take that sample out and analyze it. So, um, if uh, you haven't uh, ever read much about calcite dissolution and precipitation, it's often um, it's argued and then shown experimentally that in the system that we're looking at, that dissolution uh, can be controlled by both reaction with proton, reaction with carbonic acid, or reaction with water. And when you look at the rate of dissolution, it's often expressed as a function of those three parameters, or I should say the activity of the proton, the activity of the carbonic, carbonic acid, and the activity of water. And then, depending on those activities, if we exceed the activity of uh, this uh, uh, calcium and the uh, bicarbonate, we can have precipitation. In our case, we have only dissolution. We don't get to the case where we have high enough concentrations for precipitation. So I just worry about the first three terms. Um, these Ks then are rate constants times the activity, or you could think of them as concentrations times an activity coefficient for each of these. So we set up three experiments, and we did these in replicate. In each of the experiments, we tailored the conditions, so dissolution was either controlled by carbonic acid, or it was controlled by protons, or it was controlled by water. When it was controlled by carbonic acid, we had CO2 in the system, um, and that 
was pressurized, uh, supercritical conditions, and so it drove the pH down to 3.1. We matched that using a nitrogen atmosphere with HCl to get the same pH, and then for the water dominated dissolution, we just had a nitrogen atmosphere uh, at neutral pH. And when you look at the relative magnitude of these three terms, you can see how they vary in each of these experiments, so we get the right term to dominate. Also, we were interested in seeing if we could use an additive, in this case, an anionic surfactant, to mitigate this calcite dissolution. And so here we use a common surfactant uh, uh, used in the uh, oil field, and that's internal olefin sulfonate, or IOS. It has a sulfonate group at the end. It's negatively charged, hydrophilic. The idea is that the calcite is positively charged uh, under the pH ranges of interest in our study. Uh, these sulfonate groups come and they're attracted to the surface. And so we get a layer, um, depending on the concentration of IOS, a layer of that IOS on the surface, or maybe even a bilayer if we have enough IOS where we get another layer here, but oriented the opposite way. So we get hydrophobic in the middle and then a negatively charged group heading out into the water. So how does that IOS affect this? So when we think about calcite dissolution, uh, we think about what happens at this microscopic scale. And if you look at dissolution in calcite, you start to get these etch pits which are formed. And these etch pits, they have this classic rhombohedral shape. And this shape is comprised of a pit that has on one side of it acute edges or sharp angles. And on the other side, where the blue is, it has these obtuse angles. Also, right here at the intersections, it has kinks. So this would be an obtuse, obtuse kink, obtuse acute kink, acute acute kink, and obtuse acute kink. And then finally, it has terrace sites out here on the flat. Okay. And usually when dissolution occurs, it occurs at the defects. And so where we have these defects are these pits and these edges uh, or these kinks, and that's where we start getting dissolution of this calcite. So we took our calcite and we put it in that high temperature and pressure reactor and we did it for the three different experimental conditions, first without the presence of this anionic surfactant, the IOS, and then with it. When we look at just the black uh, profiles here, the ones without IOS present, and you look at the magnitude of the Y plot, this is over time, it goes for about 50 hours, this is concentration of calcium. We see that the calcium concentration is a lot higher when we have carbonic acid than when we use the proton or we use the water. So the carbonic acid is really driving the dissolution. We also see that when we have the IOS present, it inhibited the dissolution of this calcite when we had carbonic acid and when we had water, but not measurably with the proton. We are going to see we get some dissolution with the proton from the etch pit images, uh, but it wasn't enough to macroscopically measure. So what's going on here? The first thing we can do is we look at the etch pits that are formed on the surface. And for this, we use again laser profilometry. And when we look at water or we look at the proton, we see that we get this classic rhombohedral shape. When we look at the carbonic acid, it's truncated somewhat on the acute edges. All right, so in all cases, I, the figures are oriented, so we have the acute edges. I'll look at the rhombohedral ones. Acute here, and then obtuse here, all right? So we get some truncation on the acute edges. So much greater or faster dissolution of the carbonic acid. Uh, it appears to be propagating preferentially along the obtuse edges, both acute and obtuse propagation with proton in the water. And recall from the plots, we're getting much less dissolution here and we can't macroscopically measure it for the proton. So what happens when we have the IOS present? Here we see that for the carbonic acid, we get very, very small etch pits formed and then they're stopped. So basically once we start forming them, the IOS is absorbing, presumably, to these sites and then arresting the farther development of these etch pits. And so that's why we decrease that or at least slowing it down. For the proton in the water, we get a really interesting effect. Here we see now we're getting these triangles, so no longer the classic rhombohedral shape, but these triangles, and so it's etching preferentially in the acute direction and not in the obtuse, obtuse direction or along the obtuse edges. And so what's going on there? 
So a couple of things we can do. One, we use dislocation theory. Uh, this was first laid out very nicely in a PNAS paper by Patricia Dove. And it's basically a, a kinetic model that uses crystal growth or dissolution theory uh, and the assumption that the dissolution rate um, is going to be related uh, to basically the number of defect sites, uh, the depth of these uh, defects, and then this step speed and spacing. And she goes through a really nice derivation. And the key parameter that we're, we want to get out is this interfacial energy barrier uh, for dissolution. And you can think of it as like an activation energy barrier. And so we plot the results uh, in a way that the model would uh, kind of allow us to. And what we get are these alpha values. And so you look at these alpha values and whenever the IOS is present, we have a higher alpha value than we do when it's not. And so for carbonic acid, it's 84 versus 59, proton 122 versus 114, and water 43 versus 28. So that means there's a, this greater kinetic energy barrier, basically, or activation energy um, that's necessary uh, to promote dissolution in the case when we have IOS. That's a, a nice theoretical way of looking at it. It doesn't provide a kind of a, uh, a microscopic insight, but, but it gives us a kind of a thermodynamic basis to think about it. Oops. The other approach we use, and this was uh, in collaboration with uh, Graham Henkelman and his uh, student uh, Yagana that I mentioned at the beginning, and that's using dental, density functional theory. And so here what we wanted to do is calculate the adsorption energy of these different molecules on the surface of a calcite. And we wanted to do that at different calcite sites, which would include the acute edges, obtuse edges, terrace, and then the kinks. And so first we calculate just the energy of a single molecule, the IOS, carbonic acid, water, and proton. Then we calculate the energy of the calcite. Then we calculate the energy of the molecule bound to the calcite at the most favorable location or configuration. And from that, we calculate the adsorption energy. And so the result of that is shown in this plot. And so what you see, it's a lot of things, these represent the different locations on the calcite surface, the different kind of categories here. The slab is the same thing as the terrace or the flat kind of sites. We have the acute edge and the obtuse edge, and those are the long edges that I showed. And then we have the kinks, and that's the point where they meet. Um, in every kind of site or every site, except for the acute edge, you see that the binding energy of the IOS is greater than the carbonic acid, the water, or the proton, or the water. And so what that implies is that we're going to inhibit dissolution because that IOS is going to bind so strongly or more strongly than the molecule that's promoting the dissolution. All right. At the acute edge, it's a little bit different. Here we have the carbonic acid and the proton, proton uh, which have a more favorable adsorption than the IOS, uh, but the water has less favorable adsorption. So kind of looking at these results, we can think about, well, for carbonic acid, for example, we really slow down the dissolution with IOS, and we can see that, well, that's what you would expect based on all these adsorption energies at these different sites where the IOS preferentially binds. Um, maybe not at the acute edge, uh, but at the other sites for sure. So overall, it should slow it down. All right. The other thing we see is that, remember for the proton uh, system and the water system, we went from the rhombohedral shape to this truncated shape where we were no longer getting etching along the obtuse direction, but it's still we got etching along the acute. And here where we see the, the proton, we have a, a greater adsorption energy for the proton on the acute edge than we do for IOS. So that would indicate we should have propagation or dissolution of this edge pit on the acute direction, but not the obtuse. And so that could explain uh, that's um, that observation. So that's a really nice agreement with result, uh, but not across the board. And I'll come back to that. The other thing we did was look more closely at how these different molecules are binding to the surface. And so when you look at IOS, it binds directly to the cal uh, cal uh, calcium atoms. 
When you look at the carbonic acid, it also binds directly to the calcium. And when you look at water, it binds directly to the calcium with some hydrogen bonding to the carbonate. But when you look at the proton right here, it binds to the carbonate, not to the calcium. And so recall that we got much less dissolution with the proton, right? Uh, or I should say, when we had IOS present, we didn't measurably see a difference with and without IOS when we measure the calcium concentration in solution. And that could be because the proton doesn't directly compete with the IOS for the calcium sites, it binds to the carbonate. Whereas where we did see the IOS inhibit dissolution from a macroscopic point of view that measured calcium, we see that it does bind or compete directly for calcium sites with the carbonic acid and with the water. So that's a nice explanation for that observation. So I wish we could explain everything with our results, but there are some several unexplained observations that we have. One I think is can be a relative addressed fairly straightforward. So why does the carbonic acid result in much greater calcite dissolution, meaning a much higher calcium concentration in solution than the proton or the water? Well, that carbonic acid, it has buffering capacity, two protons per carbonic acid. We also have a partial pressure of this uh, supercritical CO2 in that separate phase above the liquid. And so we just have a lot more capacity um, to dissolve, or I should say, um, to protonate the carbonate as it comes off the calcite. And so our equilibrium concentration of calcium is much greater. And so that can explain why we have much greater dissolution with the carbonic acid, All right? Another thing we can't explain, or uh, I'd say we have a harder time explaining, is why is dissolution along the acute edge inhibited with carbonic acid when IOS is not present? And that's something we haven't figured out. One possibility is that that carbonic acid binds so strongly to that edge site that it's just kinetically limited and it takes time. And then the last thing that uh, we can't really explain is why does dissolution occur at acute edge with the water when IOS is present. Uh, remember here, this IOS has a, a more favorable binding energy than the water. And so you'd think you'd also arrest it on the acute edge for the water case, but we don't do that. And so I'm not sure if we need to think about how we calculate that binding energy uh, for the water in this system or, or what, but that's something we're still thinking about. So um, a few uh, conclusions here. One is that Microseismicity is common at the Mount Simon site, and it is likely occurring at other uh, geological carbon sequestration sites. Um, the lack of induced fractures, at least that was detected by geophysical methods, um, as well as this um, both support from the pressure measurements and support from the numerical modeling and support for this la uh, layered stratigraphy, uh, all support this stratigraphic trapping that indicates that uh, these events uh, pose little risk at, for CO2 loss from the Mount Simon Reservoir. And it also bodes well for other sites where we likely have at least some heterogeneity and layering in those storage reservoirs, as well as seals above it. Um, I'm not aware of larger seismic events at other CO2 sites, but I haven't looked into it. And so there could be larger seismic events. And I think at any site, you'd have to then uh, look at the magnitude of those seismic events and look at the uh, any evidence of fracturing uh, to see if there is the possibility for uh, this to be an issue. Um, another conclusion is this uh, acid acidic brine induced geochemical reactions um, and that degraded the uh, reservoir geomechanical integrity. And so that in our system where we looked at it dissolved carbonate cements that held these grains together. It released strain along an existing fracture um, but the strain release wasn't instantaneous. And so it's not clear when you have these reactions and the time scale they're occurring over, um, at least on the order of days, if that sort of event would contribute to this micro seismicity. And so that's, I should say, still an open question. Our results would suggest that at least for the Bandera sandstone that it's happening over multiple days and we wouldn't get those uh, types of readings. Um, and the last one is that this uh, carbonic acid is going to dominate carbonate mineral dissolution, which uh, would be expected in these relevant uh, uh, or in 
let's say carbonate uh, cemented CO2 storage reservoirs. And we observed that IOS can mitigate this process. And through different types of analysis, we found that this IOS binds strongly to these calcium sites, and this inhibits dissolution by this carbonic acid in water and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, protons. And so uh, that is all. Thank you very much. All right, so I have some questions here. Uh, first one is that given that we expect CCS to trap the carbon dioxide for thousands of years, how can you have confidence that the migration that has occurred to date in less than a decade will match the migration that will occur over that much longer time frame? How much more migration should we expect, especially if the rock is being compromised by chemical reaction? That's a great question. Um, I think um, there are studies uh, using numerical models that use the capillary pressures, that use the, um, the properties of the reservoir, uh, and that um, use experimental results on shorter time frames uh, for calibration that extend uh, these types of observations out to thousands of years. And they support that the CO2 uh, uh, does stay stored and that uh, initially you had the stratigraphic trapping, capillary trapping, and that over time you get more and more of this solubility trapping and this mineral precipitation, which is um, considered uh, uh, a long-term storage uh, uh, kind of, I guess, reservoir. And so I, I think um, all evidence points uh, to this being, a, 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 and I should say for the Mount Simon Reservoir, and uh, it bodes well for other reservoirs, but I haven't looked at those specifically, uh, but bodes well for a very long-term storage. Uh, but I think in each case, you have to look at that specifically and evaluate it. And um, there's always uncertainty but I think as more studies progress, that uncertainty becomes less. I'm not familiar with carbon capture, pardon the questions. Are micro seismicity events a predictor for potential migration seal loss of carbon in the aquifer? And the current state of knowledge, is there a way to predict where leaks may occur in the shallow subsurface? So let's see, uh, the first one, uh, is micro seismicity events a predictor for potential migration or seal loss. Um, and I think for that, um, the, there's several concerns. One, if you have seismic events, uh, basically you're getting a shift in the earth, right? That could be a slip along an existing fracture or it could be a, a creation of a new fracture. Fractures are preferential, preferential conduits, conduits for flow. And the thought is that then you either uh, create a preferential conduit or you open up that conduit more uh, through that slip event and therefore allow for preferential flow of that carbon supercritical carbon dioxide or brine that has that supercritical carbon dioxide in it. So if those micro seismic events are registered or occur in the overlying cap rock or they occur in the actual storage formation that allow them the fluid to migrate upward to the cap rock, then you always then decrease uh, the integrity of that storage reservoir. It doesn't mean you're going to release CO2, but um, then there's just an, uh, uh, it becomes um, uh, less of a barrier than you had before. Not that it's a weak barrier, uh, but whenever you have a conduit, then you have flow. If you would get, for example, a conduit through the entire uh, reservoir and the overlying cap rock, then you'd have migration upwards. And so that would be a, a problem. Uh, in terms of how to predict this, I think, you know, I've been talking a lot about fractures. We think um, in some cases there are existing fractures at sites and those can be detected. Um, and maybe that's not a good storage reservoir. So I think when you don't detect those fractures, uh, when it looks to be a competent seal, uh, that's uh, generally a good storage reservoir. You have that competent seal. And so you want to try to identify if you have those through geophysical methods. Um, another uh, uh, migration pathway is up through these well bores. You can get um, uh, fractures created or uh, maybe uh, degradation of those cements uh, that people have looked at. And that's not something I've looked at, but another kind of pathway of concern that other people are investigating. Uh, how do the reactions affect the geomechanical properties of the rock 
uh, were these effects included in the numerical simulations? So um, in terms of the things that we measured, and this would be a collaborators, I'm not a geomechanics uh, person, uh, but we measured fracture toughness, which is a, a measure of kind of how easily you can displace grains as you're dragging that stylus across the surface of the rock. And so basically, as you dissolve away out these cementing carbonates, those grains pop out more easily, and so you decrease your fracture toughness as that stylus is dragged across the top of that surface. The other way we did it was through strain release, where we put these asperities in contact with each other, uh, moved the samples relative to each other under compression, and then allowed that strain to be released. And so that is also another measure of that geomechanical integrity. Um, in the simulation that I showed that the Wright State folks did, they did not include that. That was just a, a simulation of fluid flow or the injection moving outward. There's no reactions in that and no geomechanics. I think that's kind of the, the holy grail and uh, people in petroleum engineering are working on that where they're trying to combine the reactions uh, with the geomechanics and the fluid flow all together to try to look at these integrated processes and how they're affecting uh, these storage reservoirs. Uh, that's a little bit beyond kind of the scope of what I've looked at at, at a large scale. We looked at that on a small scale. Um, and, and for me, in collaboration with others who uh, work with geomechanics and then do these more uh, larger multi-phase flow simulations. Uh, given the relatively shallow depth of the injection zone, have you all considered horizontal fracturing along bedding planes in the injection zone? Um, that's a, a really good point. Um, I am not, I haven't kept up with the application of GSCO2 uh, injection. Um, it seems uh, that in order to promote uh, this more horizontal spreading of the CO2 and to kind of inhibit the more upward migration, a horizontally drill weld uh, would be uh, more advantageous. I don't know the particulars behind uh, how the well is completed and what complications are, you know, uh, are, or what challenges uh, are there with that, uh, but it seems like a really good idea. So uh, you mentioned three different mechanisms through which CO2 is stored, solution brine, CO2 storage, and synthesis, uh, or solution brine, CO2 storage, that'd be the direct uh, gas or supercritical phase and the synthesis of carbonate. Can you comment on how important and how is widespread each mechanism in, in the Illinois Basin study? Um, the idea is that when you first inject the CO2, it's the gas or the supercritical phase which dominates. And that was in that one study where you saw all the uh, that stratigraphic trapping and capillary uh, trapping within individual pores, that dominates early on. With time, you get dissolution into this uh, water or into the brine and you get both uh, kind of advection cells, which can be set up by thermal gradients, but also by salt gradients that promote that. And then over longer time periods, as the brine dissolves and migrates outward, uh, it becomes the, the uh, it becomes buffered. The bicarbonate goes to uh, car uh, carbonate, or the carbonic acid goes to carbonate, and then you get these minerals. And so it transitions, and so over time you get more solubility and more mineral trapping. Um, in terms of the Mount Simon, I don't think there's any simulation which, well, I'm not aware of a simulation that's been done. Perhaps there has been. I have to go out and specifically look for it where they looked at long term the time scale where it transitions from one to the other. Uh, but that's the progression you would expect. So I think I'm out of time. Sorry, I have a few more questions, but I will turn it over to Matt. Well, uh, thank you, Charlie, and thanks for um, such an excellent topic uh, and talk on uh, something that's very timely right now. So uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, for those of you that are watching, uh, we encourage you to share with your colleagues the uh, tape of the video. So we're going to rec we've recorded this and it will be on YouTube uh, probably by the end of the week. So please share that and uh, please do join us again next month. So uh, thanks again, Charlie.